it seems to be going uh, very well. We now have four sworn officers, and, and we have eight, uh, still eight unarmed public safety officers. Uh, actually, it would be interesting to know, of those four sworn ones, I think three of them were already public safety officers for us, and one is newly hired, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. correct. Okay, right. yeah, all right, that's what I, what I remember. Right. Okay, uh, so I think that is very helpful to know that these are people who already were on campus, knew our campus, knew our students, were familiar with students. And as you know, we are following the recommendations from the Implementation Advisory Committee that worked uh, earlier this uh, calendar year in terms of the training because so these officers went through the same police academy training that other police officers in Oregon do but then they also go through a post academy program that is tailored specifically to Portland State. And so far there have actually been a couple of incidents where the fact that our officers were sworn officers allowed them to do things that they couldn't do before in terms of having a search warrant and search authority, uh, being able to confiscate weapons from uh, somebody who had it in their car, uh, who was uh, a, a, a person who uh, might have been dangerous. And what, you know, that's the reason why they had the search warrant to go into his car, because he was dangerous, uh, which they just couldn't have done otherwise. They have not had to draw their weapon. Uh, Again, remember, a lot of this was about having the authority of being a sworn officer. It wasn't about being armed per se, except, <coughs> except bless you, that you can't ask a sworn officer to go knock on somebody's door to serve a warrant without having the ability to defend themselves because they're doing this with possibly bad guys and they're not going to do that without having the ability to defend themselves. But, you know, you... It's it's not about how often they draw their gun that shows how useful it is. Uh, in fact, the fewer times they draw their gun, uh, the better. I hope they never have to draw their gun. Um, the uh, the other thing that is important, and because it goes back to sort of what we talked about with the UNCRA thing, is that we continue to work on these security enhancements. Right, that uh, more and more of our buildings can be locked electronically, and we only have electronic card access. While that will be routinely in place in the evenings and weekends. It also means that if there is an emergency situation, all buildings can be locked. Uh, you can still get out, but the, you won't be able to get in. So it's a way, of course, to securing buildings if there is, for instance, an active shooter scenario that they can't get into any other buildings. Now, we don't have it on every building yet. I don't know how many of our buildings yeah, we are on right now, down. but we are in a process of, of, of doing that. Um, we are looking at other possibilities uh, well, let me m mention one other thing that's very important is that we continue to have our campus public safety office, which has a 24-hour dispatch center, you know, so people can always call and they will, they can also call 911 and our dispatch center will see that there's a call to 911. So whichever one you call, we will, our dispatch center will know about it. Um, so it's, it's going well. And, uh, and it's paying off. That's the s summary statement. Well, because they were, for instance, they were specifically <clears throat> able to intercept this, this guy who you know, had, had uh, uh, guns and ammunition in his car, and he wasn't going hunting. Mm. Now, you know, would he have used it? You know, you know, he, he, he was in a dispute uh, with a girlfriend, uh, and... Uh, you know, so in a situation like that, and that's why they did the search warrant, uh, you like to be sure that the guy doesn't have uh, uh, weapons on him. One of the concerns that I heard from students is that the IAC, the Implementation Committee's report, are recommendations and that the university is not required to follow those. Um, is that valid? And also, how, um, if they are only recommendations, how closely is CPSO following those? We're following very closely, but again, you'd have to talk to Phil and to Kevin Reynolds to see exactly, you know, some of those are being implemented over time. Not all of it is happening on day one. They are only recommendations, absolutely. We, we cannot give away managerial and executive authority to a committee that would be irresponsible. We just can't do that. Uh, so they are recommendations, but we're following them very closely. Have you seen a response from faculty? No. Do you feel 
uh, that the student, the members of student union who are vocal about this, have uh, valid concerns and a valid uh, way of going about addressing those concerns? Uh, it's totally valid for people around the United States to have concerns about the issues of police treatment of minorities. I know you'd have to be uh, crazy not to see that there have been very serious issues on around that uh, uh, around the country. Uh, so for people to call attention to that, uh, to express concern and their desire to make sure that none of those kinds of things ever happen at Portland State or in Portland is a totally valid opinion. Uh, so I think that uh, calling attention to that is, is, is fine. Uh, interrupting uh, events the way that that group did at uh, the convocation for new students is absolutely inappropriate and unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Uh, it's a violation of the student conduct code. You know, the university uh, has to be able to go about what we do, our activities, whether it's our classes, meetings, whatever it is, and the student conduct code is very clear that you cannot interrupt the operations of the of the university. So whenever you do that, it's going to be a violation of the student conduct code. But you can uh, hold demonstrations, you can do tabling, you can distribute leaflets, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. There's plenty of ways, and then we have committees and hearings and whatnot. So there's lots of ways to uh, let your opinion be known. Uh, you can organize events, bring speakers to campus. Uh, I know uh, one of the founders of uh, Black Lives Matters is coming to campus, I think, next month uh, for an event. Mm -hmm. and, and, and two of the founders will be back, I think, in January. For the Martin Luther King. Uh, for Martin Luther King Day. So, you know, those are all totally legitimate activities. But, no, interrupting uh, other people's events is not, uh, that's not okay. Do you have any strategies or ideas for how to distribute um, specifics for how to distribute a, a plan or uh, a protocol to students? You know, is there any kind of like pressure on that now because we're seeing more, more and more shooting yeah. so often? No, I, th I think it's an item of high priority to, you know, on the whole, the, 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 there is no simple single protocol of what to do because you know it's different every time uh, you know the, the questions of whether you should shelter in place or run you know you, you can't come up with a guidebook and nobody would have time to read the guidebook mm -hmm. you know to tell people what exactly to do when the, the world is just not that predictable uh, but having said that uh, we will uh, be developing more plans, uh, run more training or exercises so that more people in, on campus, in departments, uh, administrative units as well as academic departments, will feel more comfortable about what might be the right response in the right situation. But it is important for people to realize that um, you know, nobody can guarantee safe, safety. You know, you can, you can do what you can, but, you know, in the end, the United States Secret Service hasn't been able always to protect, protect presidents. So how, you know, you cannot guarantee safety. And you can't notify people instantaneously of something happening because the first few minutes are usually spent trying to figure out what is happening, where is it happening. Uh, I mean, the UMQA thing, in a way, was really amazing in that eight minutes after the first call came in, they stopped the incident. You know, I wrote that's because Roseburg is a very small community, so the cops weren't very far away. It's, of course, one of the reasons. For me, frankly, by the way, uh, uh, a campus shooter wasn't the main reason to move to a sworn police force at all. Uh, but uh, it certainly is in one's mind. Uh, and it will reduce the response time. There's no doubt about it. It will reduce the response time. As we know, in cases like this, and again, you can look at Umqua, it's not hard to imagine that every minute there uh, that, the, that they were there quicker made a difference and saved people's lives, right? I mean, he would have shot more people if he'd had another five minutes. So it really, you know, a minute or two can make a huge difference. But, you know, when the first call comes in, you know, we were talking about this the other day, it takes 
a little while for the dispatch to figure out. And their first concern is going to be with getting officers and emergency response personnel to where it is happening. That's the first response. And then they got to figure out how do we now notify people. That's why the PSU alert system is so important because a mass email, you know, in spite of electronic communication, mass email is in fact not instantaneous. If I send something to 35,000 email addresses, it does in fact not happen at the flick of a finger. And there's this, you know, it takes a long it, time. It takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, takes so that's why we uh, should, you know, want people to sign up where they get the telephone, the email, uh, the, the messages, because that's the increases the likelihood. And we'll be exploring things like automatic pop-up messages on a computer screen. Mm -hmm. They do have that at Umqua. Apparently it didn't work very well, but they do have it. We do not have that right now, so that's one thing we'll be exploring. And again, to figure out what kind of emergency response plans can individual departments develop. But, you know, that takes time, that takes training. Okay, so on the subject of state funding, uh, I'm curious to know, uh, first off, with the $700 million that was approved, uh, with the, the split between the seven universities, how is that negotiated? Um, how do those negotiations go between the seven yeah. presidents? Yeah, it's not a negotiation between the presidents. Okay. Uh, it's done, uh, some part of the money is designated for special pots, mm -hmm. uh, like, for instance, a subsidy for the smaller universities, the four small, is, is built in and it's taken off the top. A couple of other things are taken off the top. The bulk of the money is distributed according to a formula. Until this current year, uh, the formula was one that had been developed in the mid-late 90s, uh, and it was based uh, entirely on the number of student credit hours, but with a different rate depending on discipline and lower division, upper division, and graduate. All right, so it was a complicated model, but, but not that hard to understand. You know, so you got less for an English under freshman than for a engineering master's students, for instance. Uh, but beyond that, it was, it was done based on student credit hours. Starting this July 1, the formula began to also take into account what we call outcomes. So you get a certain amount of money still for that same, in that same way that we did before, but some of the money is now allocated on the basis of how many graduates you have, and then there is an extra weight for undergraduate, for, sorry, for graduates from underrepresented minority groups, from veterans, uh, rural Oregonians, and in the STEM disciplines. And then there may be another category, but those are the ones, that the five that I remember offhand now. So the formula has become much more complex. Uh, fortunately, it's a formula that is more advantageous for Portland State. Mm -hmm. So uh, along with Western Oregon, Western Oregon was actually proportionally the biggest winner. In absolute terms, we were, but proportionally it was Western Oregon. We were the second biggest winner under that formula. And the proportion of the total amount of money that's going to be allocated on that basis will go up over the next few years. So we will uh, be relatively in better shape. Now, uh, there are what they call stop gain and stop loss provisions in it. So any university's funds can only go up by so much, and any university's money can only be cut down by so much. The wonderful thing this year was that because uh, the universities as a whole got such a sizable increase, we were able to rectify some of the inequities that existed without having to cut anybody. You know, even the losers under this formula still got a lot more money than they got before. Uh, you know, it's, it's a you know it's easier to redistribute a growing pie than to redistribute a, a same size, much less a shrinking pie. By the way, that didn't just happen because somebody decided to be nice to us. Yeah. I mean, that's the result of years of arguing and lobbying. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's one of those things where people just don't realize how much work. I'm not trying to you know. But the, the kind of work that administrators do, you know, it's not really very sexy a lot of the time because you're 
in these long, horribly boring meetings, in, in this case it was primarily Vice President Reynolds, sitting with the other Vice Presidents of Finance and Administration, arguing over, this. so this is actually where there was a negotiation, I might say, it wasn't between the Presidents, but it was the Vice Presidents. They tried out 57 different funding formulas. And every one of those 57 was more favorable to us than the current funding formula. And, but needless to say, the people who were relatively disadvantaged by it fought back as hard as they could. So it took a long time to get to where we are now. In, on the subject of Portland State of Mind, or more also on athletics, you talked about the new spirit of athletics. Yeah. Uh, where do you think that that's stemming from? It absolutely stem, stems from the new athletic director, Mark Rountree. Uh, you know, he, uh, he just has brought, now, uh, you could also say it stems from my dissatisfaction with the way things were, and that's why I hired an athletic director who would bring in the spirit. Uh, you know, so that was definitely what I was looking for in a new athletic director. Uh, I felt that athletics was too much sort of on its own, somewhat siloed, uh, not really engaging with the rest of the campus, and then of course that became mutual. Then, you know, we saw very few students or faculty coming to games, uh, and that then was reflected in places like the student fee committee, you know, asking about, well, why should we support these 260 or whatever the number is athletes? If athletics is seen as something for the campus as a whole, that brings visibility to the campus, that many people come to the games and are involved in, well, then it becomes much easier to say, yeah, of course this is something we support, because it is good for everybody, regardless of whether any one individual goes to a lot of games. Um, and so Mark uh, has taken up that task or that challenge that I gave him, and he is uh, doing it with gusto, and he has found that once you set the leadership from the top, uh, the, the coaches and the other staff are jumping in uh, with great energy and enthusiasm, as are the at student athletes themselves. Uh, on the subject of ASPSU uh, student government, I'm curious what your interaction and relationship has been like so far with the new administration? Well, we, uh, uh, you know, we always have regular meetings with uh, the leadership. It's interesting, it used to be just the president, uh, and I have to say, often those meetings wound up being canceled. Last year, they were very consistent, and it was both the vice president, the president and the vice president, so both Eric Knoll and Raylene McMillan. Uh, so we have had a, I had a monthly meeting with them, uh, and uh, I think they all happened, or maybe one or two got changed around. So it was a very good relationship. and. And they met very frequently with other people from the administration, you know, uh, whether it's the, the other vice presidents or all, all up and down the line. Um, we have uh, started that same thing with the new uh, student government, with Donna and David. Uh, they uh, were not available for meetings over the summer. Uh, so far, I have met with them twice. Uh, and we will continue to meet uh, regularly. Are you familiar with the recent document that they came out with their goals for their term? I haven't seen the document, but uh, David, uh, we actually had David come to uh, the executive committee meeting, which is all the vice presidents, and he presented, uh, I think he presented 11 uh, goals or, or objectives or action items. Uh, or it may have been 12, I forget how many there are officially. But, so he presented all of them verbally. I don't think I've seen the actual document. And uh, we had a very productive and fruitful discussion uh, where I think on uh, all or almost all of them, um, we already have things in place where already we are working with the students or with student government. Uh, others where we laid out how we can work together. So I think there are many uh, areas where we can help uh, make their uh, agenda successful. The only one where there's a, a small problematic element is that, you know, on, on, the, on campus safety, I think we're in agreement on 80% or whatever. We want to have campus safety. I, 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 said, I said, I haven't read the document, uh, but he certainly previously talked about that he wants to continue to push for disarming. So obviously, you know, there's no, and that's not going to happen. That's not even a discussion to be had. But you know, uh, 
but uh, in terms of finding ways, and we've encouraged him uh, and, and the others to keep working uh, with the uh, Implementation Advisory Committee and then the Oversight Committee, and, and just with, with Phil Zerzan uh, on issues of campus safety. And again, the, the Umqua shootings make clear there are a lot of things that can be done that will create, make this campus a, a, a safer uh, place. And I think we, we should focus on collaboration around that. There may have been one or two other things that, uh, but, but that's the, where, where maybe we weren't immediately in harmony, but I honestly can't remember. Newberger, uh, one of the things about the Newberger renovations, uh, why it was pushed so much is that they're saying that there's a lot of safety issues in there. If it's not starting, um, if the project's not starting until spring 2017, is that a concern? Uh, is there any reason that may not be prioritized over putting like, the new Viking Pavilion in? I understand. Well, no, we, we can't, right? We don't have the money. The state isn't yeah. giving us the money until spring of 2017. They approved it, but they won't issue the bond. So there is nothing we can do, okay. period. But, you know, we always make sure our buildings are safe. You know, we have deferred maintenance money that we use, and otherwise we would use emergency money. So it's one thing to say the building isn't safe in the long run. For it isn't earthquake proof. But you know we're not going to quickly earthquake proof it. Of course, we're going to. That's what happens when you do a major renovation. Uh, the electrical system is really inadequate. Uh, there's no immediate danger to anybody. If, it, if whenever there's any immediate danger in any way, shape, or form, of course we intervene immediately. Retention and graduation, and retention and graduation. Uh, to me, that's the the key challenge for the university, and there are many components to that. Right. Um, our retention and graduation rates have been uh, too low for a long time. Uh, we're sort of in the middle of the pack of our peers. If you look at the new federal college scorecard, you know, we're sort of in the middle of the pack of our peers. I think given the nature of our student body, we should be better than that. Um, but that involves issues of, you can start with affordability. Obviously, we know we've had to raise tuition a lot. Now, I gotta say, while we were raising tuition a lot, uh, retention and graduation went up. So, uh, you know, it's better now than when I came. Uh, so, but it, it will always be a challenge and we wanna work on that. Uh, the, the strength of our advising, you know, as you know, we only have about one advisor for every 600 students. The industry standard is one for every 300. So a chunk of the new money that we got pardon me, from the legislature, we will use to strengthen advising capacity. Um, having more financial aid counselors who can help people figure out, should I borrow, should I not borrow? What, you know, am I doing the right thing? Um, having more faculty strength uh, is very important. Uh, possible changes in the curriculum. As you know, we put in the four-year degree guarantee, and a big thing of that it wasn't really so much about that four-year guarantee, but it was about getting departments to really think very carefully about what they are offering when. And is it actually even possible to get through it in four years? Do we offer it the right way? So it kind of forced people to get rid of courses and requirements that actually were obsolete. Uh, you know, it's, it's that, and, and there's always more to be done uh, on that. Uh, so there's, you know, retention is really uh, uh, a job for the whole university. It's everything from dealing, uh, having our bursar's office and our finance office deal with students who fall behind. You know, how quickly do you tell people you can't reg register? Well, once you tell somebody they can't register, you've now increased the chance they'll never come back. But we can't let people not pay and just give them a pass. You know, you can't do that either. But so, how tough? How, much, how many people do you have to work out a payment system? How much of an emergency fund do you have to deal with real hardship cases? You know, so there's, and, and it's not like we haven't been working on this, right? And we've probably been working on this since 1946. Uh, you know, and certainly since I came in, but there's always more to be done. And it, again, it became particularly hard when the money started to get cut, the state funding got to be cut because then all those extra things that you do uh, wind up being under pressure and under stress. So 
but now having a little bit more breathing room. I mean, this is really the first year I'm here as president that we haven't had to make budget cuts. Well, that creates a whole new atmosphere, and you can feel it. I feel you can feel it on campus. People just feel better. People aren't as angry. Uh, people are just happier. Well, and uh, the provost's office is doing quite a bit to towards us as well with the uh, degree mapping. That oh, was, a million things, and it's uh, worth we've always. We've the degree mapping so far, but for incoming students especially, being able to know where to go, when to take classes, so was, uh, things like that cumulatively add up. Mm. So that's the number one, uh, and, and you'll see that the first theme in the uh, strategic plan is elevate student success, and and then the first uh, uh, initiative under that is about you know making it easier for students to get to the degree, but not easier by lowering the requirements, but by getting rid of obstacles and and uh, creating clarity and providing more assistance and so on. Uh, but I think it's also the longer term uh, goal because uh, th that doesn't happen overnight. That's a very big task. What I really, I guess, would like to know is, is if you think the, the interest-based bargaining is especially more effective than previous, uh, th than the previous. I know you mentioned that it went better. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, no, no doubt. Uh, and I'm hearing it from both sides. You can ask Pam Miller for her perspective on it. But uh, I think uh, you know both sides feel that uh, it uh, that they're while it is slow uh, because this process of identifying interests and all that, and trying to maximize all that, it just takes a lot of time. Uh, that the outcomes are better, and the atmosphere around it is better. And of course, if the atmosphere is better, uh, outcomes are going to be better. You know, because to really do real good negotiation, you need to have some level of trust. It doesn't mean you're not going to have disagreements. You know, it's not going to be like, oh, we're all on the same side. No, you know, there are different interests that need to be negotiated. But you create an opportunity for learning by doing interest-based bargaining. That's what both sides also have said. We have found out things about what the other one is worried about or concerned about that we just didn't know before. Mm. And most of those things you can meet. Most of those things are, in fact, not adversarial. You know, that's the thing. We want faculty to be happy, to feel fulfilled, to feel secure in their job, to feel they have all the support. Now, those are not just interests for the faculty. I mean, of course, we care about those. And faculty, in the long run, know that the university has to be financially viable and, and, and strong, you know? That, so we have so many shared interests, and if you create a climate in which people can talk about things, then uh, you can uh, make much more progress.